Hey folks, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today we are learning about Trans-Saharan Trade. This is a key part of Unit 2. It's also going to be a relatively quick lecture. So let's get started. So what do you already know about Africa? Today is lecture 2.4 on Trans-Saharan Trade Routes. <clears throat> This aligns with um, AP Topic 2.4, so we'll be looking at these two learning objectives. Explain how the expansion of empires influenced trade and communication over time, and please explain the causes and effects of the growth of trans-Saharan trade. Okay, so this is what I want you to be using to orient your thinking. So, let's get started. So to begin with, trans-Saharan trade means trade across the Sahara. So that means we need to have a good understanding of sub-Saharan Africa even still. We've started talking about it already, but it's useful to understand the geography. You know, I often love starting with geography. So the tropics, any, uh, the tropics are the territory that are near the equator. You see it right here. The tropics are going to be warm all year round. So my in-laws live right here in Uganda and their sun comes up around seven, it goes down around seven. They almost always have 12 hours of dark, 12 hours of light. It's almost always 70 degrees at their house um, because you just don't have as much temperature change right close to the equator. So the monsoons, which you see here, the arrows, the monsoons allow for consistent weather patterns and winds for sailing. So for one part of the year, the winds blow north, away from Africa towards India. For the other part of the year, the winds blow south, away from India towards Africa, making for easy sail in our Indian Ocean maritime system. So, Ibn Battuta is an important man to know. Ibn Battuta and Marco Polo are two names you should definitely know for this time period. They are famous primarily because they are going to travel a lot of the time and they're going to write down a lot of what they see and experience. So this is a really valuable primary source for a few reasons. One, it gives us an account of what life is like in many of these places. Two, it gives us an outsider's view of these places. So outsiders will notice things that people who are part of this culture will not. So Ibn Battuta is from Morocco. He is Muslim and a scholar, and he's probably the most widely traveled individual of this time. He will travel all around Africa and sort of the Indian Ocean and he will write detailed accounts of his visits to Islamic lands from China to Spain to Western Sudan. So you will actually look at one of Ibn Battuta's writing for um, a primary source activity later this unit. We know that there is going to be pastoralism practiced in northeastern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula, places that are too dry for agriculture. In more arid places, but less mountainous, you might have hunter-gathering practices. And near the jungles, you will see slash and burn used to clear new land for agriculture. So what you grew really was dependent on the regional environment. So, we will see in many of these tropical places, again, in Africa and in India, the creation of elaborate canals and irrigation systems because you want to really utilize your water effectively. This will be really a necessity for agriculture, but also to have clean water available in urban spaces. For example, in Muslim communities, you need to have fresh water available so you can wash yourself before you go into prayer. So in Delhi, the Delhi Sultanate, which is going to be a 
Muslim kingdom in northwestern India. It's going to be conquered ultimately by Timurlane, and then the Mughal Empire will be established. But in Delhi, Ibn Battuta will particularly admire their reservoir and water system. In West Africa, India, and Southeast Asia, we will see that human societies deeply depended on river and irrigation systems with varying complexity. So the ones in Delhi are very complex. We, we will also see that mineral resources will be really useful for these regions as well. Iron, copper, and gold will all be central to local economies. And the long distance trades of um, tropical Africa and Asia. So how did environmental differences shape cultural differences in Africa and in Asia? Okay, let's talk about some of our new Islamic empires, right? Um, Ibn Battuta is going to visit a lot of these places, so let's establish them. The first to note is Mali. Mali is going to encompass a little bit of what's modern day Mali, but we're talking about the ancient civilization. So they are going to be um, located in the western Sudan, this region, and we will see that it's a cre created by indigenous Muslims from West Africa. So what do I mean by indig indigenous Muslims? I mean that this is not m migrants. These are not Arabs who or Berbers who were already Muslim and then migrated to West Africa and set up a kingdom, right? These are going to be Africans who had converted to Islam and then later set up a kingdom. So it will be an establishment from thir the 13th to 15th centuries, AKA the 1200s to 1400s, and it will be a major source of gold. Like think gold when you think of ancient Mali. It only lasts for 200 years because the population in Mali will be so deeply diverse that leaders will be unable to keep it unified. But you see the mosque pictured there? It has been around since the 13th century and is made out of mud. So you could go and visit it today. Well, probably not today because of the coronavirus. But because it's made out of mud and clay, every year when the rains come, they need to gather more mud and clay to reinforce the walls. It's pretty neat. But the man to know in association with Mali is Mansa Musa. Mansa Kakan Musa is going to be the ruler of Mali in the 14th century. He will really establish the empire's reputation for wealth in the Mediterranean world. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, right? He's a faithful Muslim man. So he's going to go on the Hajj, pilgrimage to Mecca. And everywhere he goes, as he's taking his caravan from West Africa all the way down to Mecca, he's going to spend tons of money, like shower every place he goes with gold. He will travel with an incredibly large entourage, tens of thousands of people, right? It's essentially a city moving with him. And according to legend, he passed out so much gold on his trip because part of being a faithful Muslim is being generous, zakat, right? Giving to charity. So he is being incredibly generous with his gold on this religious pilgrimage. Supposedly, he gives out so much gold that the global value of gold will drop for years. So please watch this TED Ed um, on Mansa Musa. He's one to know. So for this time period, especially for Africa, um, you will often see Mansa Musa listed as an example. Similarly, you should know Ibn Battuta because for this time period, his writings will often serve as primary sources on multiple choice questions and on DBQs and SAQs. 
Okay, so let's focus on some practice questions. So I told you it's a short lecture today. Molly derives significant income from Mansa Musa made a famous pilgrimage that Which of the following helps to helped to increase Indian Ocean trade between the 1200 uh, between 1200 and 1500? So, for your summary, please explain how the expansion of empires in general influenced trade and communication over time, and then specifically explain the causes and effects of the growth of trans-Saharan trade. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.